Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to part four of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way. We're getting into some valuable insights from this week's guests that you can definitely apply to your own journey. Please definitely stay tuned for advice and inspiration that can help us all. If you missed the first part of the week in part one, two, and three, definitely go back. The show notes should be filled with all the links, so go and click on them if you need to catch up. Also, definitely subscribe to the channel and all the other ones if you can. It's going to really help the show. But for now, enjoy the rest of the story. So I finally get up to the hospital. I get into the, you know, the parking deck and I go to get him out of his, out of his car seat to like into his wheelchair. And he's really flopping and catches my attention. And I go, something's really not right. I get into the hospital. I go into the ER and, you know, a lot of ERs, I've got the line you've got to go through. And I skip it to like go to the desk. Well, the security card walks over to me as if to like yell at me to get back in line. You know, what am I doing kind of thing? And I immediately look at him and go, I don't think he's breathing. I need help right now. And so he immediately changes his tune. He, he yells at the nurse. I've been in this hospital a hundred times, and this is the first time I have ever at a full run, run back into the ER, into a trauma room. I mean, like running as fast as we can run to get back there. So we get into a trauma room and I instinctively unbuckle him from his wheelchair. I put him on the table that's in there and I back off in hopes that they're, they'll let me stay in there while they work on him because he's nonverbal and I can kind of tell him what's going on. Luckily they do. There's another trauma room that's open that, that they've got double doors next to it that's open that I can kind of back in and still watch what's going on. And so... I'm in there, they, they immediately start working on him. And the first thing that catches my attention is they, well, they cut his clothes off to get to him. And this guy walks over to his knee and right in the bone of the knee, drills something into his knee. I later found out it was some sort of port to get medication in him. My son doesn't flinch at all. Now, most normal folks, if you drill something into your bone, you're going to come out of your skin because of just the level of pain that that is. And he never even flinches. And so it doesn't, the the reality of the situation doesn't quite dawn on me at this point. And so they're working on him for a few minutes and they start, they intubate him, which for those that don't know, that's where they put the tube down to get into your lungs so they can get air into your lungs kind of thing. And then they're doing that and they immediately start doing CPR, doing chest compressions. And at that point, the head of ER doc walks over to me and goes, up to the minute, to the best of your recollection, how long has he been this way? And I tell her and she goes off and barks orders. And then she comes up back over to me. She goes, tell me this scenario in which the reason why you brought him up here today. And I tell him everything and she goes, okay. And she barks back orders. Well, they're doing chest compressions and they do that for about 10 or 15 minutes. And at that point they get, you know, the old, the old like electrical paddles where they used to like rub them together with gel on them and we yell clear. Well, today it's more of like pads that they stick on you in those areas. And it's like an Xbox looking machine that you press a button and it does its thing. So they do that on him and they yell clear and they hit the button and he literally raises off the table like you see in a medical drama. And I immediately look at the machine, the monitor with all of his vitals on because I've looked at it a thousand times with his respiratory related illnesses. And it literally goes boop and goes right back to what it's doing. And at that moment, I go, he's not coming back. And so I'm still compartmentalizing at this point. And they continue to do CPR and they and literally they shock him like five more times. And so after about the fourth time, the head ER doc comes at me. She goes, well, we can shock him again. But she said, I don't think it's going to change the outcome. She said, would you like us to shock him again? And I said, this is out of my medical wheelhouse. I said, it's up to your professional opinion. And so she does same things. Uh, everything still remains the same. And, you know, at this point, they're working on him 45 continuous minutes. This is the Medical dramas don't do them justice because I was surprised at how long they worked on him. And in all reality, if he would have come back with the fact that they did all that pressure on his chest and his lungs, would he have been the same child afterwards? I can't 100% say. So they pronounce him 
and I turn into the the empty room and have a moment as any anybody would. And then I have to call his mother, my wife, and let her know because she's working at home at this point, and tell her that her son that she thought was just going up to be admitted is now dead on a table. And I will never forget the sound she made when I told her that. Uh, I told her she, she kind of regained composure for a minute. And I said, call your folks who live kind of close to us. Have them drive you up. I said, you do not need to be driving in your state at this point. And so she does that. I call my mother um, because my mother had watched my son when he was younger a lot. And I told her, and I'll never forget the sound she made. She later told me, she said, the one thing that struck me during that moment is when you called me it, she said, you were almost stoically calm in that moment. And I said, well, I had to be, I said, I had to compartmentalize it because if I, if I'd have just lost it, I said, I needed to know information. So, you know, I get off the phone with them, the care team comes in and she goes, you know, I'm sorry for your loss, that kind of thing. And I, and I said, thank you. And she goes, I said, this is going to sound uh, harsh and cruel. I said, but I don't mean to be. And I point to my son and I go, I'll deal with this in a minute. And I said, but I need to know some answers right now. And she goes, well, what do you need to know? I said, is he going to get an autopsy Is or is he not? If he is, what are they looking for? What's the protocol? If he's not, why are they not? What's the protocol for why they're not going to get do an autopsy? Once they've done that, what's the turnaround time till I can get him to a funeral home? If you don't do an autopsy, who do I need to talk to to get the information to the funeral home in which I'm going to have him come home to? And I list off five or six more questions, and she literally takes a step back. And she goes, well, the first thing we're going to do is contact the coroner and have see what his decision is. Five minutes. I, so I sit with my son. Five minutes comes back. And then she comes back and goes, well, the coroner's decided that he's not going to do an autopsy. And I didn't mean for it to be, but I kind of harshly looked at it and went, why? Why is he not going to do an autopsy? And she, I said, I want to know the reason, the protocol as to why he's not going to do an autopsy. She said, well, typically in a children, children's hospital, there's like four reasons why they would would do an autopsy. She said, one, if your son were perfectly healthy, he came in here and died on this table. I said, then they would want to know why. I said, two, if it was abuse related, three, if it's drug related or four, if it's criminally related, those are the four big reasons as to why they would do an autopsy. She said, because your son has an extensive medical history with his medical needs, the coroner's just decided he's going to relate it to one of his medical needs. And I said, I'm okay with that. So the official cause was sepsis and cardiac arrest due to sepsis. Um, if, for those that don't know about sepsis, sepsis is basically an, inf uh, an, an overgrown infection inside your body somewhere. It comes from what a, a disease, a cut, anything could create it. The reason why sepsis is bad is if it gets into the bloodstream, its percentage of fatality goes from a small percentage to like 95%. It's ridiculously high because that infection then goes into the heart and it affects the heart. That's the reason why it was sepsis and cardiac arrest due to the sepsis. Now, is that what I officially believe it is? No. The reason why I say that is because I'm one that picks up on words and phrases and all that based on what I felt and saw at my house and all the words and phrases I heard while they were working at him. And then after I got the ER notes from the hospital, based on what they stated in the ER notes, I truly believe it was gastroenteritis that went, that went horribly wrong because there are variations of gastroenteritis that can, that can be very complicated and especially people that have weakened immune systems, that kind of thing. And, and, Plus, when I went to go back and read the characteristics of, of gastroenteritis, he had several of those symptoms. And so even though it's not official, I'll, I'll go to my grave believing that that's, that's what it was. Now, I still believe it was also sepsis and cardiac arrest, but I believe that the, the gastroenteritis was the beginning of it all. Yeah. It's kind of what happened. So that was up until he passed. And then... 
you know, the hardest thing was after we had spent our time with him and we decided it was time to leave, I had to put all of his cut off clothes into his empty wheelchair and walk through that hospital with an empty wheelchair, put his empty wheelchair in our van and drive 60 miles home with my wife knowing that our son had just died. Um, it was the longest 60, longest, quietest 60 miles I'd ever had is what it was. Um, so, you know, we got home, uh, the room I'm in behind me, if it, let me turn my camera just a little bit. Um, if you see that black thing over my shoulder, that's his wheelchair with all of his cut off clothes on it. I have, it has not moved since the day that I put it there two and a half years ago. Um, and there's a lot of his stuff that I've donated. I just, to this point, I still cannot donate his wheelchair. I just, uh, I just can't let go of it. Now, at some point I will just, mm. just not right now. Um, when you're ready, you'll know. Uh, yeah. When I was ready. So, you know, I went over to my folks house, uh, <clears throat> right after we got in, you know, both of my brothers were there, that kind of thing. Um, and then <clears throat> that afternoon we went to the funeral home. We went, my wife's parents went with us cause they had just lost um, uh, a relative of theirs recently and they'd used this funeral home. So they kind of knew the process is the reason why we brought them with us. <clears throat> and we get, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we went over the process, you know, we scheduled for the next day just because we needed a night to kind of process everything and, you know, figure out what we were going to do. We went back the next day and kind of made all those arrangements. So that's probably, that's, you know, the three days leading up and the day after. Um, now, the service wasn't for a week later just because of scheduling and all that kind of thing. And, you know, we typically had, I typically call it kind of the funeral fanfare. You know, after someone passed away, you got all the people coming over that first week or two, bringing casseroles and and food and all. At least that's kind of what happens in the States. Uh, people's answer to funerals is food, at least in the South. Yeah. And so they bring over food and casseroles and all. So you don't have to cook and all that kind of stuff. And then after about two weeks-ish, it started dying down. And then it was one of those, all the fanfares dying down. Now we're just left with kind of the wreckage of everything that's happened. And that was when the, the hardness really started. Mm -hmm. Well, what was the next, the following few? Well, no, no, Jennifer, uh, Sam sorry. Well, yes, Jennifer, but Samantha in all of this, how, how was Samantha in all of this for the next, for, you know, from that point? She, even though she didn't, understand it per se the way you and i would yeah but like every time i went to the hospital i would she called her brother bubba because she could say the name and so she always knew that when i took bubba to the hospital i went with him i stayed with him i brought him home mm -hmm. so when all this happened she was in school she left out that morning knowing that bubba was at home and when she got home she had this look of like well you're home where's bubba yeah and so she was puzzled for the longest while. And, and I, in the most simplistic way, tried to explain to her, well, you know, daddy took Bubba to the hospital. And unfortunately, Bubba got really sick and Bubba's no longer with us. And I said, if daddy could prevent it, could have prevented that, daddy would have, but it was out of daddy's control. And so I think she understood it, but there was a long while there. I think she hated me for it. Which, I mean, I don't take offense to it. I mean, that's how she processed it. She just knew that I left with Zachary and I didn't bring Zachary home is yeah. how she processed it. And so I th she's finally got, I mean, we're, we're two and a half years out. And so she finally got to a point where I, I don't feel like she like hated for me or blamed me for it per se. Hmm. And I mean, we all still have our moments here and there, but that's kind of how she processed it. Yeah, you can, you can, you can relate to that thinking for where you think her 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 brain's at in, in terms yeah, yeah. of age, can't you? For sure. That's yeah, they would. I think about my little three year old, um, hmm. and how she thinks. Uh, so I can, I can, I can imagine it. You know, 
Yeah. Well, no, I couldn't imagine it. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I couldn't imagine what you've been through and what you're going through and, and mm-hmm. what she's thinking. Ah, no, I really couldn't. Mm-hmm. So for the, where does your life then start to take more of a positive turn in terms of building? When, when was Letters to Zachary? How long after Zachary's death was that created? Passing, should I say? Let's see, I'm almost at two and a half years, which would be 30 months. So I would say almost two years. It was like month 21 or 22, because I'm nine months out. So 21 or 22 is kind of when it started. Because like I stated earlier, you know, it was my counselor or therapist that suggested me to, uh, to journal. And yeah. that idea probably sat on my side table for eight months from the point in which she told me. And yeah. even when I started journaling, I probably posted some of the journal entries in in this one group I was in for weeks just to give feedback. And especially after I got the initial positive reinforcement of it. So it was several weeks there, maybe even months that I did it before I even thought of it. Uh, yeah. so yeah, probably almost two years after the fact where I really started to kind of dive headfirst into it. I can relate to the journaling side of things because Pete, well, my, my trauma was workplace bullying. Um, it, mm-hmm. that really affected me to an extremely mm-hmm. deep level. And, uh, I, some, I, I've always been a very open book. I've always yeah. spoken about it, but you could see people going, here we go again. Or you can see it in their eyes and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so people, some people said, why don't you write it down? I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it was that, that man side of me came out and go, no, nah, that's girly. Uh, that's terrible to think and say, but I'm just mm-hmm. being truthful. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. Writing mm-hmm. my feelings down isn't for me, but that's what, and I'm not here to plug it and I'm not going to get it out or anything, but mm-hmm. that's why I wrote my book on, on leadership yeah, yeah. because I wanted to do that human side of leadership, but my story's in it. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, once I wrote it down, Man, it was the most powerful thing, and I'm not a writer, by the way. But it was the most powerful thing for me, and it was mm. uh, it was it was the best thing I ever did. And I always give that advice out, and I was write it down, just write it mm. down, and even just on a scrap piece of paper, just write it down. With with what was your so? How did you, Samantha and Jennifer, um, come together as a family? Then what was the the biggest contribution to you guys sticking together and getting th- and, and trying to uh, make those waves, as you said at the beginning, become a bit thinner and far between? Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.